one of the most important debates in theology concerns the nature of sin. For today's video, we are going to examine whether concupiscence can properly be categorized as sin, or if it is only conducive to sin, such that it is not sin in itself. This was a major issue during the Reformation, and is still a big issue today. Let's begin. Francis Pieper defines sin as the nonconformity to the law of God. This is effectively a summary of 1 John 3, 4, which says, quote, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness, end quote. The Augsburg Confession says that concupiscence is, quote, the inclination to sin, end quote, and adds that concupiscence brings death. We teach that concupiscence is the positive aspect of original sin as well. Samuel Rutherford, Francis Turretin, Peter Vermigli, Zacharias Ursinus, and many other Reformed thinkers define concupiscence in the same way, and they categorize it as sin. The Roman Catholic Church agrees with the definition of concupiscence, but oftentimes they will define concupiscence more broadly as any desire or inclination, as Aquinas does. So for the sake of this video, we will speak of concupiscence towards sin. Rome admits that this is a real experience of humans. However, Rome says that concupiscence is not sinful in itself. For Rome, concupiscence is only sinful when it is consented to, either in the mind or outside of the mind. Therefore, we can broadly say that concupiscence is seen as sinful in the Lutheran and Reformed traditions, but it is not seen as sinful according to the Roman Catholic Church. Thus, the question at hand is whether concupiscence is properly defined as sin, as the Lutherans and at least some Reformed hold, or if concupiscence is not sin itself but only leads to sin, as the Roman Catholic Church teaches. It is said concerning men after the fall, quote, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, end quote. Genesis 6, 5, and it is later said that, quote, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, end quote. Genesis 8, 21, such that the heart of man has been infected by the poison of sin. Gerhard argues that this not only means that the lower parts of man's soul have been infected, but also the higher powers of the soul, as the word heart in scripture also includes the mind. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is, quote, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, end quote. In Romans 7, verse 7, Paul says that coveting is sin, which is surely an instance of concupiscence, and he says that it is opposed to the law. He says in chapter 8, verse 7, that the, quote, carnal mind is in enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, end quote. But if the carnal mind is against God and not subject to the law of God, then it is in sin. Gerhard writes, quote, and as the judgment about a seed is elsewhere made on the basis of its fruit, Matthew 7, 20, so all actual sins, of which there is a countless variety, bear witness to the utterly corrupt seed of original sin, end quote. Mark 7.21 says, quote, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, end quote, and Christ says that whoever looks at a woman with lust in his heart commits adultery in the heart, Matthew 5.28. We can also add Colossians 3.5, which speaks of, quote, evil desire, end quote. Therefore, evil thoughts and evil inclinations are sinful in themselves, but concupiscence is evil thoughts and evil inclinations. Therefore, concupiscence is sinful in itself. We can say the same regarding a proud heart, which Proverbs 21.4 explicitly says is sinful. Proverbs 15.26 says that the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to God, but abominations before God are sins, and therefore the thoughts of the wicked are sins, and it should be evident from the foregoing passages that evil thoughts are sins. In Acts 8.22, Peter tells Simon Magus that he must ask God for forgiveness for, quote, the thought of your heart, end quote, but the wicked thoughts of the heart are concupiscent. We do not need forgiveness for what is not sinful, though we need forgiveness for our concupiscence. Therefore, concupiscence is sinful. Summarizing the above, we respond that if concupiscence is not sin in itself, then coveting and other wicked thoughts are not sinful. But coveting and other wicked thoughts are sinful, therefore concupiscence, even without consent, is sinful. Of course, Rome and some others would respond that evil thoughts and desires are sins, but they are only sin when the mind consents to them. Random thoughts of lust are not sin, but when you engage in further thought, or act on those thoughts, you are in sin. George Leo Haydock, the famous Roman Catholic commentator, writes, quote, sins of thought consented to and evil desires are sins, end quote, such that he admits evil thoughts as sins, but only when they are voluntary. Therefore, in his mind and in the mind of the Roman Catholic Church, actions and thoughts are only sinful when they are consented to. We will return to this later. Concupiscence is seen as sinful by several fathers, most importantly by Augustine. Tertullian lists concupiscence as sin in his On the Resurrection of the Flesh, chapter 17, and claims that Jesus taught that concupiscence and fornication are equally sinful in his An Exhortation to Chastity, chapter 9. 
Clement of Alexandria, in Christ the Educator, Book 3, Chapter 6, cites scripture and translates his passage to include concupiscence as sinful. Hippolytus calls concupiscence an, quote, evil demon, end quote, in his Refutation of All Heresies, Book 5, Chapter 4. Irenaeus, in his Demonstration of Apostolic Preaching, paraphrases a portion of the Book of Enoch and says that the evil angels brought concupiscence alongside other evil things which are, quote, hateful to God, end quote. In his Against Heresies, Book 4, Chapter 13, he says that Christ condemns concupiscence when he says that we are not to commit adultery. Ambrose says the following in his On Jacob and the Happy Life, quote, For I became aware of sin that I did not know. I became aware that concupiscence was sin, and from the opportunity afforded by this knowledge, the wages of sin have piled up. End quote. Let's turn to Augustine, who discusses the same issue quite extensively. In his work Against Julian, Augustine repeatedly states that concupiscence is evil. In Book 2, Chapter 3, Augustine writes, quote, If you would consider this attentively and without stubbornness, truly you would find in the force of habit itself how concupiscence is remitted in its guilt and remains in its action. For we cannot say nothing happens in a man when he is disturbed by the goading of his concupiscence, even when he does not consent. He could not doubt that the guilt of this fault had been forgiven him in baptism, end quote. So here he says that concupiscence is sinful and is forgiven in baptism, but it remains in the Christian. He does not merely say that it is a punishment for sin, but that it is sin itself which needs to be forgiven. In the same chapter, he asks, quote, was not the Apostle Paul baptized? Or had he not been forgiven every sin, whether original or personal, either of ignorance or of knowledge, end quote. He also says, quote, you speak as though you were able to prove or were insolent enough to suspect that, in the first creation of man, before the merited condemnation followed his guilt, such carnal concupiscence either existed in paradise or produced its base warfare against the spirit by means of the disorderly activity of which we are now aware, end quote. Book 3, chapter 13. He also says that concupiscence is a disease that needs a remedy, writing, quote, when I say this concupiscence is a disease, why do you deny it if you concede that a remedy for it is necessary? If you acknowledge the remedy, acknowledge the disease. If you deny the disease, deny the remedy. I beg you, yield at last to the truth which even you yourself have spoken. No one provides a remedy for health. End quote. Book 3, chapter 15. He also calls concupiscence the, quote, well of evil, end quote, in book 3, chapter 25. I could cite at least 50 more instances of Augustine calling concupiscence sin in his work against Julian alone. There are many more works in which he covers the matter, and I can cite those if people want, but this should suffice. Now let's turn to involuntary actions in general. Henceforth, we will define a voluntary action as one that is properly understood by the actor and is consented to in the actor's will. For our sake, ignorance and passing thoughts will be considered involuntary. First, let us consider cases of ignorance. We say that even actions of ignorance are sinful, but the fault is nonetheless lessened. Krauth correctly notes that we are not merely considered sinful before God because of our acts, but because of our entire state. We may establish this in virtue of Ephesians 2.3, which says that we are children of wrath by nature, not merely by our external and volitional internal actions. Of course, this is not a state essential to mankind, lest we condemn Adam and Eve prior to the fall. Instead, this is the doctrine of original sin, that we have become by nature children of wrath. Simply put, we hold that we sin because we are sinners, not that we are sinners because we sin. Several of the passages we use to defend concupiscence as sinful may be reused here but there are some distinct passages to examine as well. David says that he was sinful from the time he was conceived in Psalm 51.5, but clearly an infant does not perform such sins voluntarily. Peter accuses his audience of killing Christ in Acts 3.15, then says that they did such in ignorance. He then tells them to repent and be converted so their sins may be blotted out. But if their ignorance to this requires repentance and the blotting out of sins, then their ignorance was sinful. Therefore, their ignorance was sinful. Our opposition may respond that they were guilty of murder and that the ignorance of Christ's true nature was not the issue at hand. We respond that this is not found in the text and in fact runs contrary to it and is definitely from philosophical presuppositions. Numbers 15, 22 through 25 indicates that even if a sin is performed in ignorance, atonement is required. We concede that the penalty is not the same as an action committed in full knowledge and consent, but this does not harm our argument. Leviticus 5, 15 through 17 also says that an unintentional trespass regarding the things of God requires the offering of a ram to make restitution for the harm done. Verse 17 is especially clear, saying, quote, 
if a person sins and commits any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he does not know it, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. End quote. Paul is also clear in Romans 7 that he often fights his own inclinations and considers them sinful. Therefore, he considers things to which he does not consent to be sinful. He also uses the following argument. Premise 1. If actions, either internal or external, cannot be discerned, then they cannot be consented to. Premise 2. Some actions, either internal or external, cannot be discerned, according to Psalm 19.12. Premise 3. Those actions which cannot be discerned or described as errors and faults in the same passage. Conclusion. Therefore, actions which are not consented to can be considered sinful insofar as they are errors and faults. One can use a similar argument with Jeremiah 17.9 if they would like, where the prophet says that nobody can understand the heart. The blindness of the heart and ignorance is said to cause the alienation of the Gentiles from God, such that they have been given over to lewdness. But God gives them over to lewdness in virtue of sin, as we see in Romans 1. Therefore, the cause of being given over to sin is sin as well, which is ignorance and blindness in heart. In Romans 7.17, Paul even says that it is no longer him who sins, but sin living in him. Regardless of one's views on the nature of Romans 7, that is an admission that an action can be sinful even if not performed with consent. We can also add Luke 12.48, which says that the ignorant servant is punished, though he is punished less. It's important to note that even though we find that sins of ignorance are still sins and hence deserve punishment, it is said in scripture that sins of ignorance deserve a lesser punishment. How this fits into eternity is in another video, but recall Matthew 10.15 which says that it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than another town. Point is, there appears to be a distinction in punishments in terms of degree, even in eternity. As mentioned before, Luke 12, 48 says that sins of ignorance are punished, but they are punished much lighter than sins performed in full volition. Paul, in 1 Timothy 1, 13, says that God was merciful because he acted in unbelief. Recall also that in the Old Testament, those who accidentally killed people were allowed to flee elsewhere. Therefore, we can say that sins of ignorance are sin, but we have hope that God has great mercy on us and all who sin ignorantly. We cannot deny that concupiscence is sinful, nor can we say that there is some age of accountability because an infant does not know right or wrong. The Lutherans have historically held that involuntary sins are properly called sinful, and whether a sin is voluntary does not enter into the definition of sin quidditatively, as Quenstedt would say. Bellarmine, the greatest opponent of the Lutheran scholastics, writes that, quote, Nothing has the proper nature of sin unless it is voluntary, and on account of this, Augustine's definition seems to be lacking, because no express definition of voluntariness was made in it, end quote. Bellarmine therefore admits that the greatest Western theologian does not admit the addition of the term voluntary into the definition of sin. Of course, the Lutheran Church gladly accepts the definition of Augustine in this respect, and agrees with him that a sin need not be voluntary for it to be properly called sin. Finally, we turn to objections. Objection 1. James 1, 14-15, says that lust brings forth sin, therefore it is not sin in itself. We reply that lust itself is sin, and the fruit of lust is also sin. Nothing in this passage suggests that lust in itself is not sin. It is also said in Matthew 5, 28 that lust is sin. Job 14, 4 also says that no clean thing can come from an unclean. Matthew 7, 15-16 says that we shall know false prophets by their fruits. And James 3.11 says that a spring cannot send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening. These passages therefore conclude that an unclean effect proceeds from an unclean cause. So there's a quasi-univocal generation in the act of sin. The Lutheran dogmaticians would also say that James 1.14-15 speaks of original sin yielding actual sin. Therefore, this passage does not avail to show that concupiscence is not sin, but only its effects are. Objection 2. David and Bathsheba's son died but surely he is in heaven, for David says that he would go to him in 2 Samuel 12, 21-23. This, therefore, proves that the age of accountability is a true doctrine, or that sins of ignorance are not counted as sins, or they are not actually sins. We reply, we cannot overthrow the texts mentioned in this video in light of this text, a more obscure one. There's also nothing that indicates that their son made it to heaven because he was innocent. The Lutheran could easily respond that he had faith. It's also possible that he was circumcised, as it's not absolutely necessary that a child reach eight days before circumcision. Regardless, the text is not clear, and other clearer texts lead us to say that all are guilty of sin because all have sinned. Nor do we deny that God can be merciful to infants.
However, we cannot use this passage to establish an age of accountability or a general principle by which the ignorant are said to be exempt of the consequences and punishment for sin. Objection 3. Paul, in Romans 7, speaks as a man prior to conversion, not as a man in the Christian life. As a consequence, this passage does not show that concupiscence is sinful in the regenerate, but only in the unregenerate. We reply that this is not fully relevant to the issue at hand, whether Paul speaks according to his pre-conversion or post-conversion self, or even if he speaks in the stead of Adam or Israel. This objection requires that what is sin to the unregenerate is not sin in the regenerate, but we deny this because grace perfects nature, does not destroy it. God forgives the regenerate for their sins, but what opposes the law of God still opposes the law of God, even when performed by those who are covered by the righteousness of Christ. Otherwise, we would not really be able to say that apostasy is possible. This objection, therefore, is a non sequitur, as it says that if something is said to be sinful in the unregenerate, then it is not sinful in the regenerate. And if one wants to reformulate it to say that what is sinful for the heathen is lawful for the Christian, they would need to supply us with evidence. Objection 4. That infants are called innocent in Psalm 106.38 and Romans 9.11. We respond with Gerhard that this speaks of actual sin, not original sin. Therefore, this is a kind of relative ignorance and does not undercut the true doctrine of original sin. When someone speaks of innocence in our own lives, we often do not speak of absolute innocence, but of a kind of relative innocence. For example, when a man is accused of killing another man and he clearly did not commit it, we say, he is innocent, he did not do evil. But we do not mean that he has never sinned. Therefore, this does not lead us to overthrow the previous texts mentioned and conclude that there are no sins of ignorance or that there is an age of accountability. 